Before I begin, let me ask, how many people are here for the first time today? Raise them high. It's okay. All right. And how many people are here that have been here for the first two talks? Well, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. The reason why I'm asking that is that we began on the first Saturday with some basic groundwork. We talked about some basic misconceptions about the book of Revelation. Popular errors that you see on TV, in the movies, and wherever. Sometimes even in churches. And I also, once we resolve some of those misconceptions, I also gave you some basic introductory information about the book of Revelation. I'm going to review with, the, you, uh, review with you those, those topics very quickly. If what we're talking about is of interest to you, or you think, gosh, I don't remember that, I was here but I don't remember it, or I wasn't here and I really should know that, you can go on the MP3 files, or I don't know how all that stuff works, but you can get on the internet and listen to those, those files because it's very important for you if you're going to read the book of Revelation to understand that introductory information about the book of Revelation. Otherwise, you'll be very confused you get deep into the book, which we are today. <coughs> so on that first Saturday, we talked about the literary style of the book. Remember, there are two types of prophetic styles. There's audio and visual. The book of Revelation, like uh, Ezekiel and Daniel, is primarily that type of prophetic literature, visual. God shows a vision of the prophet, a prophet and then explains to the prophet the meaning of that vision. And some of that, sometimes those visions are strange to us and scary, and we associate it with modern-day experiences and but if you read in the context, you'll find that the vision is always locked into that historical setting. And it's destined for the people during the time of the prophet. <laughs> symbolism of colors, symbolism of numbers, we talked about all of that. We can't go through all that again. But remember, when you read through the book of Revelation, numbers and colors are used symbolically. And you don't need to have some sort of little code to break it and figure out what it's all about. You need to read the first part of the Bible. What I mean is the Old Testament and the rest of the books of the New Testament. The book of Revelation, in many ways, is, as one of my professors once said, the final exam of the Bible. The author assumes you know the Old Testament like the back of your hand, that you know the story of Jesus and the political setting and the religious setting of the first century. If you don't know those things, when you come to the book of Revelation, you can just forget it. We also talked about the literary structure of the book. Remember, the book begins with a prologue, and it concludes with an epilogue. That prologue and epilogue are essential for you to understand the basic contents of the book. The prologue, which no one likes to read, locks you into the historical setting, unfortunately for many. Right? You have to, you're forced to read the rest of the book the way the book intends you to read it. And that is as seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor, giving you information of what is and what is to soon take place. Soon there, as ordinarily defined, does not mean 2,000 years later. And the is is a reference to the first century and the very moment when John is on Patmos, as he describes himself, in exile during the tribulation. We hear about the tribulation coming. Uh, you missed it. It was 2,000 years ago. The tribulation, John says, I'm in the midst of the tribulation. And you Christians of Asia Minor who are also in the midst of the tribulation, stand firm, hold fast, and see the salvation of your God. So the prologue and the epilogue lock us in that historical setting. In fact, at the end of today, we're going to finish with the epilogue and see how it says exactly the same thing as the prologue and gives you some consoling words again. And again, unfortunately for some, or disappointing for some, locks you again tightly into that first century setting. After the prologue, which talks about John, the author, being ex exiled on Patmos, and giving his command to write the letters to these seven churches of Asia Minor. We then read through those seven letters, and we were again locked into the historical setting of the first century problem. Christians in the first century are being tempted to either fall back into Judaism or 
to fall back into polytheism, depending on their origin. And one of the temptations with these polytheists who had come out of there into Christianity, into monotheism, was to fall back into that, eating food offered to idols and all of the temple problems of the first century. We're going to look again at that topic because that is the uh, one of the problems we saw last Saturday and we will see today in the heart of the book of Revelation. After the seven letters, we saw seven seals. A scroll with seven seals and Jesus unlocked that scroll and popped every seal off. And when we got to the seventh seal revealing the contents of the scroll, it opened seven trumpets. And the seven trumpets then opened... And continuously we see these stages of seven. We talked about that in the literary structure and Leviticus chapter 26 and the use of seven and all of that information. For some of you who weren't there on that first day, that might be mysterious information. But if you were there on that first day with us, you remember the use of seven, the symbolism, Leviticus 26, the covenant, and all of that. So let's pick up where we left off last time with another look and a quick review of that imagery which is so often confusing for modern readers. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Revelation chapter 13. Two things we see at the end of the book of, of chapter 13 is this number 666 and the mark of the beast. Two of the more common misconceptions about the book of Revelation or sources of that for modern readers. So first, let's begin with this number 666 and talk about that quickly. I began this discussion by asking about some of the more common misconceptions of this number. Sometimes people think, well, it's one less than seven, so in seven is the number of perfection, so six must be imperfection. And six times three must be complete imperfection. This is the number of the Antichrist, and oh boy, there's Obama. Well, it, that's a little slippery. You slow down and you look at the number, and you realize if you know the Bible, the number six is never shown to be a number of imperfection. In fact, there's a number of examples I can give you of six being a beautifully perfect number. And the reason why that would be a misconception for you, I've seen it as imperfection, because seven doesn't mean perfect in the Bible. Seven in the Old Testament is usually a reference to covenant. In the New Testament usually a reference to the Gentile world. And again, we talked about this on the, in the first Saturday together. The number six, therefore, is not one less than seven, therefore imperfection. The number six is, is actually a perfect number in many ways in biblical numerology. God creates the world in six days and calls it good. Very good. How many wings do the seraphim have? Six. Do they have the mark of the beast on them? No. Okay. So the number six is not a number of imperfection. Well, what is the number six doing there in the book of Revelation? The confusion over this number and misunderstandings of its numer of biblical numerology has led to some very strange ideas. I punched in on the internet this morning just for fun, 666. <laughs> wow, I came up with some great stuff. There were pictures of people with barcodes on their foreheads and all sorts of neat things. Neat for us in modern day in science fiction, but has nothing to do with the book of Revelation. One of the more common misconceptions, and about half the web websites I came up with, and this is why I talked about it with you, is the confusion over the title Vicarious Fili Dei. And that's on your uh, handout there. Vicarious Fili Dei. In Roman numerology, this adds up to 666. And with a little bit of sleight of hand, I impressed on you last Saturday about the problem with this title. Who is Vicarius Fili Dei? <clears throat> we all know, don't we? The vicar of the Son of God. Oh, yeah. You comfortable with that? Well, Vicarius Fili Dei, while selling very papals we talked about, has never been used in the history of the church 
for a title of the Pope. The Pope doesn't have it written vis- under, you know, inside his tiara or something, which was one of the theories. Well, we don't see it. He never talks about it. That's because it's invisible. No one sees it. It's, it's engraved on the inside of the tiara. Well, when you go to Catholic University and go to the shrine, there's a tiara there in the shrine. And you can check the tiara. It ain't there. So, and again, that has led to some websites to say, well, it's only on some TRs, you see, and they've erased it off the ones they've given out. Okay. So, Vicarious Fili Dei, where does the title come from? This title was invented, first of all, so some of the problems in the series, was invented by those anti Catholics in the late Protestant Reformation who were trying to, to bring Christians out of the church. And so Vicarious Filii Dei adds up to 666 because it's what you call circular reasoning. 666, an, an individual took that number and tried to calculate a title that sounded papal and added up to 666 and he finally got one. Now, I explained to you the problems with that theory. Remember we talked about the interpretive models of the book of Revelation. There are three basic interpretive models. One of them we get really giddy about. That's the futuristic model. It all is about the end of the world. And the beasts. And America. I just heard it on the radio the other day. I was listening to a Protestant radio station and Tony Evans. Tony Evans. Guy's nuts. He was talking about the book of Revelation. And the end times. And chapter 17 that we're going to look at today... The great beast with the seven heads, that's America. And the woman riding on his back, the harlot, that's Iraq, obviously. And the chalice of abominations is the oil by which she controls the nations. (laughs) You think that's funny? Tony Evans is one of the most influential Protestant preachers today. So, and that's not far off from the average interpretations you'll get in Tim LaHaye and the rest. There are actually some very good Protestant theologians and preachers out there who are trying to discredit this craziness. Hank Hennegraaff, R.C. Sproul, some very good, solid Reformation Protestants, who I don't agree with on everything, obviously, but they are trying to get the evangelical world out of this craziness and anchored back into what the Bible actually says about the book of Revelation. So, Vicarius Filii Dei, invented just a couple hundred years ago, Because it adds up to 666. And 666 must be about the Pope. Because the title is, you see. Alright, you getting dizzy yet? Now, what are some other problems with this Vicarious Filii Dei? Well, it's in Latin. And I'm using Roman numerology, Roman numerals, to make this work. Remember, the book of Revelation is written in Greek to Christians of Asia Minor who don't speak Latin. And furthermore, Vicarius Fili Dei doesn't actually add up to 666. Because, though I can write this on the board very quickly and move some things around, it looks impressive. You remember on last Saturday when we added this up, over half of the characters here, I had to put a zero on them. What is the major problem with the Roman numerical system and why don't we use it in elementary school and on our calculators? It doesn't have zeros. And so, Vicarius Fili Dei, using the Roman numerical system, doesn't even add up to 666 anyway. So, remember though, in the end, the book of Revelation, 666, has to mean something to the Christians of the first century. The book of Revelation itself says it is about now, the present moment that John's receiving the vision, and what is to very soon take place. Well, what could it be? If it's not Vicarious Filii Dei, what could it be? Ellen Gould White. Some of you might be thinking, who's that? Ellen Gould White is the major prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She's dead now. But Ellen Gould White, her name, which you'll rarely see written all the way out like this because it's very uncomfortable. You'll see it as E.G. White, sometimes just E. White. 
But Ellen Gould White adds up to 666. Remember again the Roman numerical system? 50, 50, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5, 50, 500. And the W is the tricky one. Double U or double V is 10. Two fives. So you have 10, 0, 1, 0, 0. 666. <gasps> you like that one better than Vicarious Feely Day? I do. In fact, this is a fun one to remember next time the seven day Adventists come to your door. Now, is it Ellen G. White? Is she the one that has the mark of the beast? Is she the Antichrist? Remember, the Antichrist doesn't appear anywhere in the book of Revelation, first of all. And the answer is no. Ellen G. White is not the fulfillment of this passage of the book of Revelation. What is it? Well, you have to know something about, because again, I'm using Roman numerical systems there, and look at all the zeros. You have to know something about Hebrew and Aramaic characters in the first century. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, Wow. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. That is our numerical system today, right? The Aleph, a simple Aleph is one, it's written that way. A bait, you can see this, a two, a three. Our Arabic, we call them Arabic numerals, comes from the same Phoenician alphabet. And in the ancient world, they didn't have a numerical system and a alphabet. They had one system of characters, and they used it, depending on their math or their writing, they used it for both. And so, therefore, names lent themselves to uh, numerical values and, and then symbolic references as well. The sixth character of the Aramaic alphabet is the wow, W. W. Thus, what is the answer to the question I asked you? What is the symbolism? It's very simple. <laughs> you see? It's the internet. Wow, wow, wow. WWW. And in fact, I can confirm that for you. I can confirm that for you with another point. If any of you are good at math, have you ever tried dividing 2,000 by the perfect number 3? You know what you get? 666.66666. Thus, we know from these calculations that the end of the world will come in the year 2000. <laughs> Didn't work. Although this was one of the theories. Okay, so... And why did we know that? Because this is when the internet really started to take off in the year 2000. We could see the whole thing coming together. And you know whose else name adds up to 666? Bill Gates. <laughs> using another numerical system. Using the very computer system and numerical system that he devised for computer programming. Aha! You see it's all coming together. All right. Again, remember the model. The interpretive model, futuristic, doesn't work. The book itself says it is about now, it is the present moment of John on Patmos and the seven churches of Asia Minor, and what is to very soon take place. You're locked in over and over that historical setting throughout the book, in the prologue and the epilogue especially. So, what could it mean to the Christians of the first century? And by the way, you could do this with any uh, visa. The Visa card, again. Look at the name Visa, using three different numerical systems. VI, that's six, right? The S from the Greek stigma, which is the numeral, numeral six. And the Babylonian A has the value of six. Six, six, six. Better switch to MasterCard. Right? No. What did it mean to the Christians of the first century? That's the question you need to ask. Remember our first Saturday together, we talked about the context. Context, context, context. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand what the prologue and the epilogue says about it, what Jesus said about the book in, in the midst of the book, 
And from there you can have some hope of maybe figuring out what the number 666 means. Now, we are at a disadvantage, the average Christian, to the Christians of Asia Minor. You know what the major difference of the Christians of Asia Minor and, and us today? Is the Christians of Asia Minor knew the Old Testament. Modern day Christians don't know anything about uh, maybe Oprah, right? Donahue, CNN. In the first century, the Christians were saturated with Old Testament imagery. And that's why the New Testament authors just use it explicitly throughout their text. And sometimes, unexplicitly, they expect you to understand the Old Testament imagery. So the Christians of Asia Minor had two things going for them. They were there in the first century, and they also knew their Old Testament. We can help ourselves figure out the vision of the first century Christians by knowing the history of the first century and going back and reading our Old Testaments. So, what did the number 666 mean for a Christian of Asia Minor in the first century? Again, remember, we're in the midst of the tribulation. 666, because of the Arabic numer or the Arabic or the Hebrew or Aramaic, it's all the same system. The 666, according to that system, and this is on your handout, adds up to the name Neron Kazar, which is the Aramaic form, which also appears in the rabbinic writings, so the first century and second century, in reference to Nero Caesar. Well, that's a little cryptic. Well, it's not cryptic for them. For you, Nero is some name you memorized in elementary school. For the Jews and the Christians of Asia Minor, Nero is the most hated enemy in the first century. Nero has killed Jews and Christians alike in massive droves, lit the Christians on fire, he uses torches at his parties in the backyard. Horrible, wicked man. And so that you don't have nightmares, I'm not going to go into all the details about Nero. But Nero was a ferocious, a ferocious animal. A beast in the first century. Horrible, horrible licentiousness. Anyway, Nero. A very logical choice. Nero and Caesar adds up to 666. And furthermore, you might say Nero with an N. Why not just Nero Caesar? Well, if you drop the N off, you get 616 which is actually the manuscript variant that shows up in the book of Revelation, showing you that the earliest scribes who were making copies of the book of Revelation understood the referent here to Nero. So, you might say, alright, okay, I can see that, but gosh, you know, 666 from what you just showed me could add up to probably a lot of different names and people in the first century. And it could. But the Christians of Asia Minor have something else going for them. Remember, they know the historical context, what I just gave you. But they also know their Old Testament. And what most Christians today who read the book of Revelation don't know is the number 666 does not appear for the first time in the book of Revelation. But the author expects that you know the reference to this number in the Old Testament. If you open up your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 10, you'll find that Solomon, in his iniquity, in his corruption, though he was the wise man, and his very name means peace, was very wicked and was very stupid. He repented at the end, thank God. But Solomon, with all of his wealth and all of his power, had fallen into a fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 17, which talked about, as a prophecy of Moses, that when you go into the land and you put a king over you, make sure he doesn't multiply his gold, his wives, and his horses. Why? Those are the three ways that man has power in the ancient world as a king. Multiplying his gold, you can buy off armies or buy armies, or you can buy off your enemy. Multiplying your horses, you can fight your enemy. It's the Sherman tank and F-16 of the ancient world. And multiplying your wives, why would that happen? You see, the very first marriage of Solomon, and many of the marriages and the first marriages of the ancient world, and you know this probably from even the royal dynasties of Europe, is that there are marriage alliances between countries and nations. Solomon had a thousand marriage alliances. All of the kings, all the powerful men, any powerful individual surrounding him, he married one of their daughters. 
right? Because they're not going to attack or rebel if their very daughter is on the throne or in the palace. Moses had said kings cannot do these three things. Solomon is shown by the author of 1 Kings chapter 10 to have failed miserably. Solomon, as we're told in 1 Kings chapter 10, had 666 talents of gold that came to him every year. 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 14. What does that mean? Well, that means Solomon has the mark of the beast. No, it's the other way around. The mark of the beast is to be understood in light of 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 14. Every Christian in the first century would immediately recognize this. And why is this helpful for you? Well, remember, historical context, the most wicked king in the time, Nero, who was abusing and using his power to persecute the people of God. Solomon did the same thing. Furthermore, the Christians of the first century also had the Old Testament, and they knew it like the back of their hand. And the number 666 again pointed to the very same conclusion. The most powerful and wicked man of the time. Solomon, the great king over the army and the empire of David. Nero is understood to also be like Solomon in his stupidity, in his erroneous use of power, and his abuse of the people of God. So, the number 666 would not be confusing for the, for the Christians for a century. And again, for us, this kind of numerology and things is a little strange. But you are probably familiar with one of the more common numerological uh, calculations, and that is in Matthew chapter 1. After Matthew has laid out for you the descendancy from Abraham to David to the Babylonian exile to the time of Jesus, he says that these are divided into 14 generations. 14, 14, 14. The reason why he says that is the very name, you look on that little chart I gave you on the handout, the very name David, D-W-D, is how it's written in Hebrew. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, Wow, one, two, three, four, five, six. David is written Dalet, Wow, Dalet, which adds up to not 666, but 14. And Matthew is trying to show you that Jesus is the perfect son of David. It was in this generation that the great son of David would arise, who is both son of Abraham and son of David, and he will now bring about all the promises to Abraham that began back in Genesis chapter 12 with the call of Abraham. That's on your handout as well. Now, related to this topic, and we saw it also last time, is the mark of the beast. And we went through it kind of quickly, and now having what we, what we talked about here might make some more sense to you. The mark of the beast, 666, what's the context? In the first century, in Asia Minor, the Christians were being forced to worship Caesar. One of the things that the Christians did not do was worship any god but Jesus. And the Christians of Asia Minor were being tempted to do this by the Roman religious authorities in Asia Minor. In fact, one of the early martyrs of the church, Polycarp, died over this at the instigation of the local Jewish synagogue. So, Caesar worship. If you didn't worship Caesar, they knew you were a Christian. And you wouldn't be able to buy and sell in the marketplace either. This is one of the ways in which they let you in. So, the mark of the beast on your forehead and on your hand is a reference back to the Torah. Exodus chapter 13, this is in your notes, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and a number of the references say that the Torah, the Moses' law, must be as a sign on your forehead and a sign on your hand. That is, everything you see and think and everything you do must be in accord with the law of God. What is the very first and essential commandment of the law given by Moses? You shall worship no other God but Yahweh. And in fact, as you read through the rest of the, of the Pentateuch, and you read through the historical books and the prophetic literature, you see over and over again, this is the one intolerable sin. 
When you worship another god, the covenant is over. And so, therefore, in Revelation chapter 13, again, the Christians of the first century, knowing the imagery, know that the problem is, is they no longer have the sign of God on their forehead and on their hand, Exodus chapter 13, but now they have the sign of the beast, the law of the beast, that is, the Roman Empire, to worship Caesar. So, Flip over with me now to Revelation chapter 13 and let's continue and see some confirmation of some of the things we just talked about. Revelation chapter 12 told us about the birth of Jesus and the dragon, which is identified as Satan, trying to consume him, but failed. Chapter 13 tells us about the rise of the beast from the sea, which is a fulfillment, as we talked about last Saturday, of Daniel chapter 7, also an allusion to Daniel chapter 2, the dream of Caesar. The fourth beast coming forth from the sea is explained to us by Daniel to be the fourth empire from Babylon, which is, by all calculations, the Roman Empire. So, during the time of the Roman Empire, the Son of God will arise and His kingdom will be established. And we see that vision both in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. And we see John trying to show you over and over through this book, referring back to Daniel chapter 7, that the time is now. And if you read Daniel chapter 7, you find that the problem is that the beast from the, the sea, that is the Roman Empire, persecutes the Christians or the saints of the kingdom of the Son of God. And that's what the book of Revelation is telling you all about. John is on Patmos because of the tribulation of the Roman Empire against the early church. So, chapter 13 tells us about the pagan religious authorities, this is the beast from the land, trying to get the Christians to worship the beast from the sea. And this is a reference to the sprinkling incense to Caesar that we talked about. And all those who do receive the mark of the beast. Chapter 14 tells us, remember, we already saw someone had a mark, and that is the people of God. Chapter 14, then I looked, and on the Mount Zion stood Lamb, and with him 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So God has marked his own as well. Gosh, now this is really getting confusing. You mean God has futuristic, subcutaneously implanted computer chips as well? No. In fact, again, you're locked into the historical context. You're locked into the biblical imagery as you read the rest of the story. What is the distinction of those who have the mark of the beast versus those who have the mark of God? Keep reading. Chapter 14 tells us this in verse 8. Uh, I just flip down to verse 9 there. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image, and receives a mark on his forehead, that is, breaks the law of Moses, follows the law of the beast, the Roman Empire, he also shall drink the wine of God's wrath, poured and mixed into the cup of his anger, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, the prince, the holy angel, and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These are the worshippers of the beast and its image, whoever receives the mark in its name. Here is a call for endurance of the saints, the saints in the first century, who keep the commandments of God. What is the most important command of God? Worship no other God but the God of Abraham and the faith of Jesus. And I heard, verse 13, a voice from heaven saying, Write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord henceforth. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Thus, the mark of God versus the mark of the beast is what you've chosen to do in your life. In fact, we'll see this throughout the New Testament. You are marked or known by your fruits. And the book of Revelation continuously goes back to this issue, and most importantly, with whether or not you've worshipped another god. Now, Flip over to chapter 17. We'll look at one of the more confusing passages after the book of, or chapter 13. Chapter, four, or chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bulls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot 
who is seated upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and with the wine of whose fornication the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. Who is that? Iraq. Watch. And the carried, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of blasphemous names, and had seven heads and ten hordes. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and bedecked with gold and jewels and pearls and holding in her hand a cup full of the abominations, the impurities of her fornication, and on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon, the mother of harlots, and the earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. What's going on? Well, the beast we've already seen, and the beast will be identified again for John in this chapter, but the beast is the very same beast with seven heads, ten horns, from chapter 13. That beast is described to you very carefully by John to be the fulfillment of Daniel chapter 7. That is, this beast is the Roman Empire. But riding on this woman, or on this beast, which is also described to be many waters, remember the Roman Empire gathered together all the peoples of the land, the region, Upon this beast, which is also described as many waters, is a woman who is described as a horrible harlot. And she has a chalice in her hand by which she makes all the nations and all the people around about drunk. Who is this harlot? Well, she's bedecked in scarlet. Now, what country or what church has hierarchy in scarlet? <clears throat> Seventh-day Adventist asked me that question once, and, and he paused like that. What do you think? Yeah. Well, uh, that's an interesting theory, but let's go back to the first century, okay? So, what would be the point of this vision for John and for the Christians of Asia Minor in the first century? That's the question you need to keep asking yourself, because it's written to them, not to us. Well, the Roman Empire is the beast. And in fact... The, one of the earliest, the earliest interpretation of Daniel, the earliest exegetical work we have of the church on any book of the Bible is Hippolytus, writing around the year 200. Okay, about 100 years later after this vision. Hippolytus, in his exegesis of the book of Daniel, identifies for you the tradition of the first century, and that is that that fourth beast is the, is the Roman Empire. Victorinus, writing about a hundred years after that, identifies the problem in the mark of the beast and the marketplace exactly the way I described it to you. That is, Caesar worship and the temptation of the Christians to do that lest they be killed. But who is this woman riding on the back of the beast? To ride on something is to get power or authority from it. And there's two different ways to interpret this woman. But you don't have to guess. Verse 7. The angel said to me, Why marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman. And the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns that carry her. The beast that you saw was and is not, and is to ascend from the bottomless pit. This is language based that we saw already in chapter 13. It has to do with the history of the Roman Empire in the period. And the dwellers on the earth whose names have not been written the book of life from the foundation of the world, will marvel to behold the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Verse 9. This calls for a mind with wisdom. So if you're wondering, what are they talking about? Well, he'll explain to you. Verse 9. This, was, uh, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads of the beast are seven hills on which the woman is seated. They are seven kings also, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he will only remain for a little while. Wow, that's weird. It's not very weird. It's very simple. The city or the empire that has been known throughout history as that which is seated on seven hills is what? Rome. The ancient world it was known for this. It was the great empire, the great city that unified these early... Etruscan groups and the rest, and had become the Roman Empire eventually, symbolized by the great city seated on the seven hills. Now, I think, well, there it is. It's the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> well, it can't be the Roman Catholic Church, first of all. Remember the historical setting. But, even if you were to forget the, the historical setting and think about the future, Vatican City is not on one of the seven hills of ancient Rome. The city still is. 
smells or smog and mosquitoes. But Vatican City is not on one of those seven hills. In fact, it's on the other side of the Tiber River. It has nothing to do geographically with the ancient city of Rome. So, what is this setting? What is this seven hills? Well, it tells us explicitly that it's the beast. Again, confirming Daniel's vision. This is the fourth empire, which is seated and has its dominion starting on the seven hills of ancient Rome. But who is this woman sitting on top? Well, you don't have to guess. The book continues and explains it to you. Verse 15. The beast and its rider have a rough relationship. Verse 15, And he said to me, The waters that you saw where the harlot is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns that you saw, they, they and the beast will hate the harlot, they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. So, they go on the rocks. The woman is sitting on this beast. She has a wonderful relationship with it. It's very powerful. Imagine you riding on a horse, a great war horse or something. But then the animal that she's riding on, suddenly she loses control of it. And it turns around and devours her and burns her up with fire. That which she trusted in became her greatest enemy. That which she used to fight her enemies now is turned on her and has become her enemy. And it says that when she is devoured, she will be burned up with fire. Verse 17, For God has put it into their hearts to carry out this purpose by being of one mind and giving over their royal power to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So, what's going on? Again, verse 18 is helpful. And the woman that you saw, put on your seatbelts, is the great city which has dominion over the kings of the land. Wait a minute, something strange. The Roman Empire devours its own city? No. The city of Rome had a lot of problems. And there were lots of rebels. But the beast is going to continue here. It will continue and it won't be destroyed until Jesus does a couple chapters later. Thus the beast has, the Roman Empire has destroyed a city which formerly trusted in it the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. You might think, gosh, that sounds like the city of Rome. Well, remember, the Christians of Asia Minor have an advantage over us. They know the Bible. Okay? And they've also read the rest of the book of Revelation. The great city has already been identified for us in the book of Revelation. Flip back to chapter 11, verse 14. When the destruction of another city was described. Chapter 11 tells us about the city where the temple of God is. Not a great mystery for you, but if you haven't figured it out because you're a Christian of Asia Minor and you're a little distance from the land, it's explicitly told to you. Verse 8. The great city, which is allegorically called Sodom and Egypt, take your pick, the place where our Lord was crucified. And in 70 AD, the great beast came upon the harlot, who had harloted herself off to the power of Rome. We have no king but Caesar. Apostasy in the Old Testament. Fornication. Covenantal fornication in the Old Testament. She was burned to the ground with fire. In 70 AD, just as Jesus had predicted to the early Christians. Within one generation, all of these things will take place, he says. And exactly a biblical generation, 40 years later after he said that in Matthew chapter 24, Jerusalem was destroyed. So, what's happening as you're reading this? You might be thinking, this sounds like I need to know more about the Old Testament. And maybe I need to review some history. Yeah. When you read the Bible, your code for understanding it should not be CNN, Tim LaHaye, Tony Evans, and whatever else. Your code for understanding the Bible has been given to you. There are 72 books of the Bible. Somebody asked me, how can I learn about the book of Revelation? How can I prepare myself? What book should I read to know this stuff? The first 71. Okay? You've got your reading assignment. 
If you want to understand the book of Revelation, you have to become a Christian in the first century. You have to know what they knew. And one is the historical setting, and two is the rest of the Bible. You have to be immersed in the Word of God. And to the, to the degree that you are immersed in the Word of God, and particularly the Old Testament, the New Testament will flower for you like a beautiful rose, including the book of Revelation. To the degree that you don't know the Old Testament, is the degree that the New Testament, and its most complex book, the book of Revelation, will remain closed to you like a little flower that's bud. And you'll wonder, what's in there? So, to find out what happens when the flower opens up for you, to smell the hope of God in the first century, you have to come back after our break because we're going to finish the book. So, we were looking there at chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. There's a lot of stuff there, I know. And you're thinking, well, he's not, why don't you slow down? We can't. We have to finish the book. So, there's a lot of stuff there. As I already told you, the book of Revelation, as one of my former professors once said, and it really rings true, is the final exam of the Bible. It expects you know the rest of it, like the back of your hand, so that you can flip, you know the story of Daniel and Ezekiel, and the visions can move back and forth between those visions of Daniel and Ezekiel and expect you to apply it to the first century. So, that should encourage you to go back and learn two things, the Old Testament, to understand the New, and the first century historical setting, the politics, the religion. Who were the Sadducees? Who were the Pharisees? All that stuff. If you understand the New Testament and you don't understand the religious difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, you can forget every dialogue Jesus has with them. Because the dialogue he has with the Pharisees is very different from what he says to a Sadducee. And the reason comes down to their difference of understanding of the religion of Israel extremely important for understanding that issue in the first century. So, the other thing, which I told you, two things, Old Testament and the historical setting. Open your Bibles again to chapter 17 and look at verse 10. And you might think, well, that was really neat. I mean, first century, Roman Empire, the uh, uh, woman riding on the horse or on the beast... But well, there's something else that locks you in again to the first century, in 70 AD, and that whole era in the first century. Not only were we told at the end of this vision that the woman is the great city, and in chapter 11, verse 14, that the woman in the great, uh, the, the great city is the place where our Lord was crucified. Now you might think, gosh, why would they speak about Jerusalem that way? Well, all you got to do is go back and read the Old Testament. Almost every prophet referred to Jerusalem. In particular, you might want to write these down, Ezekiel chapter 16, Ezekiel chapter 16, and Ezekiel chapter 23. Explicitly. In fact, the whole Hosea, the whole prophet Hosea, is all about Jerusalem and Judea has become like a harlot. The whole book of Hosea is about that. Because they have denied their Father and God, and have harlotted themselves off to other nations and other powers, which is what the Christian or what the Jerusalem and its inhabitants had done in the first century. We have no king but Caesar. There's something else that locks you into the historical setting. You see that in chapter 11, verse 10. I'm sorry, chap- Revelation chapter 17, verse 10. As he's describing to you this beast, he says, verse 9. This calls for a. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, verse, uh, yeah, verse nine. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. So before John had this vision, one is, and the other is yet to come, but it'll only remain a little while. Well, the one who is, is the one you need to figure out if you want to anchor this book into the historical setting. And commentators do differ on it. Many commentators, in fact the vast majority, identify the one that is, the present reigning emperor, is Nero. Because many of the things in the book point to Nero. There are a minority of scholars, and their argument is very strong as well, that the one that is, is Domitian. 
And it all has to do with when do you understand John was on Patmos? Was he on Patmos during the persecutions of Nero, which were horrible? Or was he on Patmos during the persecutions of Domitian? Was this in 68 that John had these visions, or was this in 88? And we don't know. But what you are locked into again is that these ten kings, or the seven kings here in this context, the seven kings, one is and one is yet to come, both Nero and Domitian were followed by very short reigning emperors. And again, so it's, it's debated among scholars. But you can see there, one is at the present time that John is seeing the vision. The woman is the city of Jerusalem, identified in the very book itself for you. So, now, after Jerusalem was destroyed, you still have a problem. Those who were persecuting the, the people of God were not only the Jewish religious authorities in Jerusalem, but after they themselves became the target of persecution by the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire also turned on the Christians and started to fight against the Christians, in particular with the persecutions of Nero, during which time Peter and Paul were martyred. Chapter 18 tells us about the destruction of this city and the great praise to God for having finally destroyed this persecutor of the early church. And by the way, this destruction had been prophesied in all of the post exilic prophets. Chapter 19 continues to tell us about the destruction of this horrible harlot city that had forsaken the God of Abraham and then begins to speak in contrast about a beautiful woman, the new bride of God, which is the church. In fact, this is what Paul, how Paul describes the church, and you see references to the church even in Jesus' words in the Synoptic Gospels and elsewhere. The church is the new bride of Christ. It is the fulfillment of all of the hope in the Old Testament. And so chapter 19 speaks about this new beautiful bride for God, and a marriage feast, and a marriage, uh, a marriage celebration. Beautiful description. But remember, the problem is, as though Jerusalem has been destroyed, you still have a major persecutor of the Christians, especially after 70 AD, where they're focused primarily on the Christians. And that is this beast from the sea, the Roman Empire, and its pagan religious authorities of Asia Minor, the beast from the land. You still have to deal with them. And God deals with them for you. You see this in chapter 19, verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice, and he called all the birds that fly in midheaven, Come gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders. Verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who sits on the horse and against his army. So against his church. And the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet, which is the other name for the beast from the land in the book of Revelation. Both the beast from the sea and the beast from the land, or the false prophet, were captured by the king who was on the horse. The false prophet who in its presence had worked the signs which had deceived those who had received the mark to worship the beast from the sea. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with brimstone, and the rest were slain by the sword of him who sits upon the horse, and the sword that issues forth from its mouth, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So also, we're told that there will be a great battle after the destruction of Jerusalem against the church and the persecutors of the church, that is the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was shortly destroyed after this episode. A number of sacks of Rome, almost every couple of decades, show you that Rome and its empire have been completely obliterated. Now, we don't talk about the Roman Empire so much anymore, or, or the city of Jerusalem in the ancient world, except in our history books. But we do have some modern history written for us in the book of Revelation. And we've now come to it 
in the book in chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the bottomless pit with a great chain. He seized the dragon. Remember, chapter 12 told us about a great dragon who was the serpent, the deceiver of the world, identified as Satan in chapter 12, who was using the Roman Empire to persecute God's people. That is, the beast from the land. The beast from the land, the Roman Empire, and the religious authorities of Rome have been destroyed, the throne of the lake of fire. But you still have an enemy to deal with. That's the guy who was behind it all. The great dragon. And Jesus deals with him as well. He takes the great dragon, the serpent, the deceiver of the world who deceived mankind from all the way back at the beginning of the book of Genesis. And what does he do to him? He bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him. And he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be loose for a little while. Hmm. Thousand years. What are we talking about? Well, this reference here is, as many book passages in the book of Revelation have been confusing for those not steeped in biblical imagery. Some have suggested that, well, maybe Jesus is going to return and there'll be this battle, this tribulation in Armageddon, and then there'll be a thousand year reign of Christ in Jerusalem, and the Jews will start offering calves to him and stuff. Well, that's not what the book of Revelation tells us. Jerusalem had been destroyed. The Roman Empire had been destroyed. The major persecutors of the Christians in the first century and the second century are now destroyed. And now you come to the free reign of the church. And this is the majority interpretation for the last 2,000 years of this passage. That the thousand year reign of Christ is a reference to the reign of the church. You might think, well, wait a minute, let's see, 1,000, 2,000 years? These guys weren't very good at their math. Well, again, remember the first day we talked about biblical numerology. Numbers are used symbolically. In the Bible, on a number of occasions, this is one of them. The number 10 and its multiples are references to a multitude. A thousand in the Bible is the number of an immeasurable amount. Solomon had a thousand wives, and his heart was turned away. Here, the church will reign for a thousand years. Christ is victorious for a thousand years. In fact, there's a number of places in the Bible where I could show you a thousand used symbolically. One of the best examples of this is in Psalm 50, verse 12. Psalm 50, verse 12, And God is the God of the cattle on a thousand hills. What about the other thousand? What about the rest of them? Wait, there's more than a thousand hills in the world? The th number 1,000 there in Psalm 50 is being used, or Psalm 51, depending on your calculations there, is being used as a reference to the immense power and authority of God. He is the God of all the animals on a 1,000 hills. That is, He controls it all. Thus, in the book of Revelation, and again, the majority interpretation of this verse throughout the history of the church has been this is a reference to the reign of Christ, which is immeasurable. But we are told that that rain will come to a little blip on the screen at a certain stage, and that's at the end. At the end of the history of the church, at the end of the reign of Christ, Satan will be loosed. And he will come out to deceive the nations. Are you scared? You shouldn't be if you've, rest, if you've read the book of Revelation. In fact, if you've read anything in the last couple of chapters, you realize that you, as the Christian who have the mark of God, should not be scared. Patiently endure. Look at chapter uh, 20 and see what happens when Satan's released from his prison at the end of the life of the church, however long that may be. Could be... We know it's at least 2,000 years. Could be 5,000 years. Could be 10,000 years. Could be 10 billion years. But when it's all over, at a certain stage, Satan will be released from his chains. And this is what's going to happen. Verse 7. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be loosed from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations once more. 
He will gather the nations. They're the four corners of the earth. That is Gog and Magog, barring from Ezekiel's vision, the nations of the north. Who is Gog and Magog? Well, it's Russia and China. We all know that. Right? Again, historical setting, first century. Gog and Magog. This is after the reign of the, of the church that in the end, Satan will be loosed. He will gather all the nations against God's people. Gog and Magog are symbols of that enemy of God from the book of Ezekiel. They have a historical setting in Ezekiel. Here it's being used symbolically. Described as all the nations. Verse 9, And they marched up over the broad earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, not the harlot city, the beloved city, that is, the church of the living God. This is not one location where this is going to happen. This is, at the end, the church will be persecuted. All nations will try and destroy. This is Satan's last chance. And look what happens. If you're scared, keep reading. And they marched up over the broad earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were to be tormented day and night forever and ever. You have some hope? Don't be scared. Jesus is your king. If you're scared about a serpent coming out, or you're scared about Gog and Magog and the end of the world, you don't understand who Jesus is. He's God. And He's the king of the universe. And you don't mess with Him. You want to make sure you're on His side. So, especially in a battle. Verse 11, Then I saw great white thrones, and Him who sat upon it, and from His presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. This is what you learned about the end of the world, Sunday school, right? The books were opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by... What was written in the books, that is, by what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead in it, dead and ha- death and Hades gave up their dead, and all were judged by what they had done. What kind of a mark did they have? Did they keep the commandments of God or the commandments of iniquity? In the first century, the law to worship Caesar. Verse 14, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So, we are told that at the end of the history of the church, which we have no idea how long it will be, we know it's more than a thousand years, it's already been 2,000. Could be 5,000, 10,000, 10 billion. Satan will be released from his chains and will attempt... Emphasis on attempt to destroy God's church, His beloved city. But God will protect the church like His beloved bride. And Satan and the enemy, as it surrounds the people of God, will be flung into the lake of fire. Fire will come down from heaven to protect you, His beloved bride. Hope, not fear. In fact, when that all happens, the dead will rise. Christ will judge from His throne all those by what they've done. And those who are not part of the bride of Christ, who do not have the mark of God, will be thrown in the lake of fire with the dragon and the beasts. And then, good news. Really good news. It gets better. Chapter 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more, and I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. We're back in Eden, but better. He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. Four things have passed away. Chapter 22. 
Then he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Through the middle of the streets of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life. We made a home. With twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves and the trees were for the healing of the nations. There shall no more be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And His servants shall worship Him, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. And night shall be no more. They need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they shall reign forever and ever. This is Daniel chapter 7 fulfilled. And he said to me, These words are relatively trustworthy. (laughs) Read this epilogue carefully. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and trustworthy. True. And the Lord, the God of spirits and the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must take place in 2011. (laughs) What must soon take place? And he, behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am he who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said, You must not worship me. I am a fellow servant with you and your brethren, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God, not Caesar. And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of this prophecy, of this book, for the time is at least 2,011 years from now. (laughs) Is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, the filthy still be filthy, the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to eat to the tree of life, that they may enter the city of, of, by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and fornicators and murderers and idolaters, everyone who loves practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. The churches of Asia Minor. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come, let him who hears say, Come, let him who is thirsty come, let him who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plague describing in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life, the holy city, which are described in the book. Those are some verses that are oftentimes misunderstood. Think about the first century context. John is writing this letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor. They are going to be taken by hand in a scroll from Patmos across the sea in a little boat somehow, maybe hidden, we don't know how it got there, to Ephesus. And from Ephesus, it would be ran from church to church, and they would make copies of it for their individual churches and spread it throughout the whole region of Asia Minor because the time is near. And if anyone messes around with what's said in here, you're going to be in big trouble because the stakes are high. So the book of Revelation is sent to these seven churches of Asia Minor and carries strict warning with it at the beginning and at the end. Blessed is he who hears it, and blessed is he who reads it aloud, because the time is very near. At the end of the book, again a warning, don't change a word of this prophecy, because the stakes are very high, the time is near, and I'm coming. So, verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. And so in closing, covered a lot of material last three weeks. I know that. This vision given to St. John, being written down and sent to his seven churches for their benefit, encourages them to persevere in faith, hope, and love. 
with the assurance that God will have victory and will soon relive, relieve them from their present sufferings in the tribulation. In concluding vision of the book, Christians of Asia Minor are told, as we just saw, that as soon as God has destroyed the beast from the sea, the dragon will be chained for a thousand years, assemble the Bible for an immeasurably long time, during which Christ and His church will reign victorious. In this final vision, Christians throughout the ages have found consolation. It is here that the faithful Christians today may also find good news for their own lives. For just as the book prophesied, the beast from the sea was indeed shortly destroyed. The Roman Empire is no more. And we can therefore have confidence that the dragon has been chained. In all the trials and tribulations that we face today, with the secular world turning further and further from God, with apocalyptic like events flash before us on the evening news. Christians can have hope. For we know through the revelation given to St. John that Christ is already victorious over the devil. And now we who follow the Lamb of God only await with hope the second coming of the Lord, at which time the devil will be cast into the lake of eternal fire, and Christ will be shown victorious in all things. On that day, our Lord will wipe away every tear. Death shall be no more, for the dwelling of God will be with men, and they shall be His people. Far from the modern notion of the apocalypse as a story of death and destruction, the book of Revelation is rather a book about the victory of God and His people over every evil and adversity. Thus, the book of Revelation is not a cryptic manual for unlocking the mysteries for the future end times generation, but rather, as with all the books of the Bible, it is a source of hope and life, for man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Thank you very much. Usual uh, rules apply. We're going to go maximum of uh, five questions. Keep it to five minutes total, not per question. And, uh, and make sure your question is one sentence and has a question mark on the end. I hear there was a question over here already. Yes. yes. If Satan was chained and yeah. in for all these years since John wrote this what is the reason for all of the destruction the world wars the, yeah yeah it's yeah, a good question the you know, wait a minute if Satan's been chained for a thousand years I mean have you not been watching CNN <laughs> Throughout the history of God's people, we have always had trials, tribulations, things to endure. And all of these things are testing, opportunities for us to have hope in God and trust in His Word. Satan is chained now. And there we can have hope in all of these visions we're having on CNN and things. Because you know God is actually in control. You may think, yeah, but I mean, look at how bad things are. No. Look, have you ever heard about a possession? Someone who's possessed. Maybe you've probably seen the, uh, you know, some movies about these things. Do you know what happens when a priest walks in, starts talking to that demon? He binds him. And he casts him into hell. A human being, being able to bind a demon that has possessed another human being and command them to give me your name. I command you, come out of this man. That is the power of God. At this stage in history, Satan has a lot, of, uh, a lot of show, but very little actual power. The greatest power he has over us is fear. And so we're afraid of what might happen in this, or what's going to happen in Iraq, or what's going to happen, oh my goodness, the end of the world is coming. You're distracted because of fear and a lack of hope and trust in God. So, when you see CNN, 
don't fall into the trap. When you see the, something scary happening, or you learn about world history and this is happening next, and what, have hope. Know that God is in control of all of this. And just like the Wizard of Oz, moving all the fancy stuff, Satan is out there doing that to us right now. And while it's really scary when Dorothy came into Oz and saw the smoke and all this stuff, wow, Dorothy figured it out. It's that movement of that curtain back there. She goes and she sees the little man back there moving ropes and things, and it was controlling the entire region. That story is a great story for us today. You know what's behind the curtain. Satan is bound. He can move ropes, he can make steam come out, and all sorts of scary stuff happen. And you have a choice. You can either submit to the scary Wizard of Oz or to the King of the Universe. Okay? Yes. Yes. Is there going to be an Antichrist with a capital A on the end of the world? Say that again. Is there going to be an Antichrist with a capital A before the end of the world? I don't know. And the reason why I'll say that, that I don't know, uh, Dr. Schlub asked, is there going to be a, uh, a great Antichrist that's going to arise? On the first day, we talked about the use of the Antichrist in the Bible, as opposed to the way we like to use it. The way the Antichrist title is used in the Bible is in 1 John and 2 John. John says, you've heard an Antichrist is coming, and many Antichrists have already come. And so we know it's the last hour. We know we're in the final stage of history. Well, many Antichrists have already come. As you read 1 John and 2 John, you find the Antichrist, the identity of those Antichrists, are those who have left the early church and have chosen to reject that God has actually come in the flesh. Why not? The Incarnation. I like that. That's neat. Well, not if you're a Greek in the first century. Greek, the Greek pagan religions had a problem with the flesh. Spirit was good. Flesh was bad. Heaven good. Sky good. Earth bad. Hard stuff bad. And so to say that God, who is heavenly in spirit, becomes flesh is to mean that you know the total disaster has taken place theologically. But that was the Christian message that God had become flesh to raise us up again. And so, one of the major problems for the Christians in the first century was this, this confusion over the role of the Incarnation, what it was all about. And so, the Antichrist in the first century are those who denied, as John identifies, that Jesus had come in the flesh. That's in 1 John and 2 John. Will there be some great Antichrist who will come? I don't know. What we do know is the book of Revelation, at the end, at the end of the thousand year reign, right at the end of the world as we'd like to say, all it tells us is that Satan will be released, gather all nations together against the church, and then Jesus will appear and annihilate them. Pretty helpful and pretty hopeful. And in fact, that's the exact same information we get from another of the other books of the Bible in the New Testament that talk about the end times when Jesus returns. It'll be just like that. So, will a great Antichrist arise? I suppose. We are all, as I talked about on the first Saturday, all of us, to the degree that we fail to love our brother, whom we can see, but say we love God, who we can't see, as John says in his first epistle, are liars. And lying in 1 John is the spirit of the Antichrist. To the degree that I sin against my brother, to the degree that I fail to love as Christ loves me, is the degree that I submit to the spirit of the Antichrist. Right? I fail to understand what the Incarnation was all about. God becoming man. So, uh, will one I don't know. You know. Tim LaHaye. Ask Tim LaHaye about that. So, yes, Carol? You mentioned Victorino. Oh, I did mention very quickly, we were going fairly quickly through the information, Victorinus, Victorinus was an early father of church, Victor Rinus, and he wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation, which Tim LaHaye doesn't use very often, and that was written around 350. There's also another uh, writer you should be familiar with, I mentioned him, and that was Hippolytus.
Hippolytus wrote a commentary on Daniel around 200, pretty early. And it's there that he identifies the beast from the sea in Daniel chapter 7 as the Roman Empire. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, quick one. Um, you were mentioning about the two divisions of either Nero or Domitian. Yes. Um, for those who are going with Domitian, how do they get past the five who have already passed away? Because if you start with Julius Caesar, mm -hmm. by the time you get to Domitian, you're up to about seven, uh, seven or eight. Minutes. Yes. Uh, well, if afterwards, you can come and I can show you some of the calculations that people use, scholars use, to identify either the one that is as Nero or Domitian, but we get into too many details right now. Uh, but the um, calculations of which Caesar is reigning at the time based on Revelation chapter 17, the one that is and those that were before and the, ones that will short, the one that will shortly be, those calculations actually both work fairly well with Nero and Domitian. And that's why, like I said, you have major camps in bi biblical scholars, I mean serious biblical scholars, uh, as opposed to like Tim LaHaye, that understand the historical setting of the book and actually read what the book says. It is about now and the very near future. Yes? Uh -huh. And I'm just wondering, how does this jive with other world religions? Or, you know, numerology? It, numerology, the whole <coughs> revelation. You know, I've, I've heard um, a priest around here um, speak about... Sorry, Pastor, um, Father Saunders. Father Saunders has spoken about how all world religions had a um, prediction or uh, prophets that talked about Jesus. Like, this revelation, like, did they talk about revelation also? Or... I don't know about that. That would be something to check with a church historian. Father Saunders is a great source for that. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, one last question, and then we will we'll close with that. Yes? Along with the uh, Antichrist with the capital A, I was wondering if you could talk about the two witnesses who are supposed to appear and the testimony of the earth and perform miracles. The question's about Revelation chapter 11. It says that in the city where the temple of God is, two witnesses will arise. One is able to close up the heavens so it does not rain. The other one is able to turn water to blood. This is intended for you, who know the Bible well, to understand a reference to Moses and Elijah from the Old Testament, the two great witnesses for God, the two great prophets. And in fact, these two great prophets appear to witness to Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. Did they appear in 70 A.D.? Well, they did appear on the Mount of Transfiguration during the time of Christ and witnessed to Christ Jesus being the one that all the prophets were waiting for. And this was a witness to the Christians in the first century as well. And so it may be in Revelation chapter 11, it could be a reference back to the Mount of Transfiguration, where we do know that those two did appear. Did they appear again during 70 AD? I don't know. We do know from Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian who was writing during 70 AD. He was a Pharisee. The Roman Empire was coming down through Palestine, and he got captured. But... When they captured him, he said, you know what? I believe everything you guys are doing is the hand of God. And by the way, I know the way into the city. <laughs> so Josephus became an advisor, a counselor to the Roman army as they're attacking Jerusalem. And he sat on the sidelines with a little pin under the Roman tent, recording the whole thing. And records a number of things that happen that would be strange to us. God sent prophets again. He sent one man named Jesus again. Jesus was a very common name in the first century. Joshua. He sent a, a prophet named Jesus who ran around the city, throughout the city for three years while the Romans were sieging and saying, Whoa, whoa to this city. Not very fun to have him at a party. Can you imagine? Whoa, whoa to this city. Can't you say anything else? Whoa, whoa to this city for three years. He wouldn't stop. His voice was getting hoarse. He would just scream. And finally, they kick him out of the city and he's running around the city in circles, screaming to the people in the city while the Roman Empire is out in the, in the outskirts. Whoa, whoa to this city. Finally, they got tired of him. They threw a rock and hit him in the head and he died. And he said, whoa, whoa to this city and woe is me. So Josephus records for us, and I recommend very highly for you to read it so you can get anchored into that first century 
the destruction of Jerusalem and all the signs that accompany it. Unbelievably beautiful signs that God gave to those who were still in the city, who had not fled to the hills, as Jesus said, when you see these signs, who were still in the city when the army finally got there. These are the guys who failed to jump off the roof and run to the hills. They were still stuck. Okay, let's close with that. If you have any other questions, I'll remain behind. You can ask me questions afterwards. Thank you for coming.